Hi everyone, it's Andy from Tales from the Heart. Thank you for joining me uh, for this Folklore Thursday. As you can see, I'm outside, which is a uh, quite nice change from being in my small uh, stuffy room uh, telling these stories, so that's good. I've been thinking a lot about um, prehistoric stories, um, uh, especially Stone Age ones. We, we don't know what people were telling back then. We've got ideas, but um, we don't really know, um, especially in this country. We've got a few few little glimpses, for example, the Fianna stories, the Finn McCall ones, Amy and I tell. They are supposedly from the Iron Age, so the end of the prehistoric period here. <clears throat> and uh, so it's said that they were passed down uh, generation to generation and eventually a few centuries later written down, but we, we don't really know. And likewise, much earlier we have cave art. You've got these wonderful paintings and sort of frescoes of uh, hunting scenes and things like that. Um, in these caves, but again, we, we think they're telling a story, but we, we just don't know. We've got some glimpses, though, uh, if we look around the world, um, because the thing to remember about prehistory, it, it doesn't have a defined end date around the world. It's not all the same. For example, in the Stone Age, um, or the Bronze Age here, um, Egypt, uh, Greece, parts of Asia, they were already writing and recording things. So prehistory had ended there while we still had it. And likewise, throughout the world, it's, it's finished at different times. Some of them very recently. Um, there have been uh, hunter-gatherer nomadic tribes uh, all over the world uh, and Stone Age farming communities. A massive one was founded in the 1930s in Papua New Guinea. And if we look at their stories, it's a better indication of what Stone Age societies would be telling. And you'll notice a theme throughout the world, whether it's in the Amazon basin or Papua New Guinea, all over, you notice a theme, which is uh, creation and how things came to be and why things are the way they are, uh, which makes complete sense, because, I mean, that's what we're all trying to make sense of, right? Uh, I've got a story for you that um, hopefully would uh, not be amiss in uh, Stone Age Britain. Now, I can't claim uh, ownership of it completely. I've based it quite heavily on a Comanche story from North America um, called the Clever Coyote. So, uh, yes, but it's my interpretation, changed a little bit, added some bits that I, I feel would make it fit into, um, into British Stone Age um, storytelling. So, yeah, I hope you enjoy it. A long time ago, when the land was covered in forest and mountains, a monster lived. High up in the mountains he lived, in a great cave. And this monster was bigger than anything that walked the land and it would eat what it wanted, who it wanted, and when it wanted. Its favourite time to eat was night, and it would come stomping down through the forest, ripping up and bashing trees aside, gathering up anything it wanted to eat. And while it would eat other creatures, while it would eat people, its favourite food to eat was deer. And one day, the monster decided that he was sick and tired of having to stomp down the mountain, pick up his food, carry it back up the mountain. He shouldn't have to do that. He was the mightiest creature in the land. And so he decided he would gather up as many deer as he could. And so he came down one night and gathered deer under each arm, dozens and dozens of them, and carried them up to the mountain. There he put them behind a fence made of fallen trees and broken branches. He knew he had enough to last him a while, but he would still have to go hunting again eventually, and so he returned for more and more and more, and eventually, after a few weeks, every deer in the forest had been gathered. There were none left. The giant was very happy about this. He knew that he would not have to go hungry ever again. The rest of the creatures and the people that lived in the forest below were not so happy, though. They relied on the deer as well. One in particular, Wolf. Now, Wolf was cunning. Many feared Wolf, but Wolf was also very clever and respected. And so he called a great gathering of creatures and of people. Back then, people and creatures could communicate a lot easier. They could talk to one another better than we can now. And so these creatures and the people, they met in a great clearing in the forest to decide what was to be done. The only thing they could agree on was the fact that they could not confront the monster in his lair. For it was dangerous to confront a bear in their cave, let alone 
a monster in its lair, and also they did not know how strong and big he had become on all of this deer that he was eating. And so, it was then that Wolf spoke up. I have been to the cave, and outside I have listened, I have watched, and I have sent, sniffed the scents in the air. And I have discovered that the monster is not alone in his cave. He has a human child, a girl there with him. He makes her clean his cave, tidy up his mess. She cries at night, she is lonely. I say, we send a pet up there for her to know and to love and to love her back. And maybe together they can release the deer and escape. Both people and creatures thought this was a good idea. But who would they send? It was decided that Mouse would be sent. Mouse was small. He could sneak in places that were hard to get to. He was quick, he was wry, and most importantly, he was very cute. The girl would love him. And so the mouse clambered up the mountainside and entered the cave. So quick and small was he, he managed to avoid the monster's gaze, and soon he found himself sat before the girl, who was delighted to see him. She loved Mouse, and she was about to stroke him, about to give him a name, for you see, only humans named things. But then, Monster looked over and saw. If you do not get rid of that creature, I will come over there and sit on it and squash it to jelly. The girl was terrified. Mouse was even more terrified, and the mouse ran all the way back down the mountainside and scurried back to the clearing. It was decided then they would try a different approach. They would send Hare. Now, Hare was not nearly as cute as Mouse, but he, he was handsome in his own way. He was strong, he was brave, and most importantly, he was very, very quick. He declared that he would get up to the mountain, into the cave, he would befriend the girl, release the deer, and escape before the monster knew what was happening. And so he ran up the mountain, into the cave, quick as a flash, past the giant, before he could see him, and before the girl. Now, upon seeing Hare, and seeing how impressive his speed was, Girl loved Hare. However, before she could stroke Hare, before she could name him, the giant once more looked over and saw the creature. If you do not get rid of that thing, he cried, I will come over and gnaw its flesh from its bones. Now Hare did not much fancy the idea of this, and so he quickly ran back down the mountainside, back to the clearing. It was then decided that Wolf would go. It was his idea after all. He was not as quick as Hare, nor as cute as Mouse, but he was clever. And so he made his way up the mountainside. And as he approached the cave, he waited in some bushes for the sun, that fire in the sky, to burn low in the west. Now it was around that time that people and creatures start to get a bit sleepy. They're either going to sleep or waking up and he knew the giant would be off guard. And as it was, he crept inside, the monster was busy picking bones from its teeth. The girl was sitting in the corner on her little pile of straw that passed for a bed, and the wolf quietly approached and gave her hand a gentle nuzzle and lick. She immediately loved wolf. And as the giant was too busy picking those bones from his teeth, she stroked him and she named him, she named him Dog. And she and Dog had a lot to talk about. And as they were talking and getting to know one another, the monster started to wonder why his cave had not been cleaned yet. And he looked over and saw the girl talking to the wolf. That's it, he cried. If you do not get rid of that thing right now, I am coming over and eating both of you. Well, this was enough for both wolf and the girl. They ran as fast as they could out of the cave. They hid in the bushes, in some trees, and there, catching their breath, the girl started to cry. She was happy to have met Dog, she was happy to have made a new friend, and she was happy to have escaped that cave, but it was the only life she had known. And not knowing how to cheer her up, Wolf decided to sing. Now, the moon was high in the sky at this point, bright, and as we know, when wolves 
sing to the sky. They howl. And as we also know, that when wolves howl into the night sky, there is not many things on four legs or two who do not feel at least a pinch of fear in their heart. And so, as the girl cried, wolf howled, and those howls echoed across the mountain into the cave, and there those howls pricked at the ears of the deer gathered within. The deer began to get scared. Their hooves stamped, their heads swayed side to side, their antlers clicking and clacking against one another, until the tension was so great, one of the deer, a young one, made a bolt for it towards the barricade, towards that fence. As soon as that deer left, the others ran after it, smashing through the fence. Straight, they ran towards the cave's entrance. The monster tried to stop them, but he could not, and soon he was knocked over and trampled, badly hurt. The deer, now they had found their freedom, scattered out of the cave's mouth into the forest. The monster trudging after them, limping and wounded badly, trying to catch at least one or two for dinner. The girl and the wolf made their way back down the mountain, and they found the gathered people and the gathered animals and they told them what had happened. And the girl, wolf, and the people went back to their village and gathered their weapons. And so, when the sun rose in the east, the monster was trudging back up the mountain, limping, hurt, wounded, sore, angry, and very hungry. He was no match for the warriors he found within his cave, armed with spears and with fire. He would never bother anyone ever again. And from that day forth, the people knew that if they wanted to eat deer, if they wanted to trap deer, they could not take too many if they didn't want the balance to be upset once more and all the deer to vanish. Girl and the wolf were inseparable. And so were their ancestors, the ancestors of that girl and also the ancestors of wolf forever known from then on as dog. Thank you very much for joining me for that. I, I do hope you enjoyed it. Now the First Nations, the, uh, the Native Americans, they have so many rich and wonderful stories. I do really recommend you don't just read that original one, but you, you try and read some more as well or listen to some more. They're, they're really brilliant stories. As ever, please, if you haven't done already, like and subscribe. Uh, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, it's all there. We are raising money for the Trussell Trust. Um, they're doing some fantastic work uh, in a really difficult time for a lot of families, uh, supplying them with food and essentials. Um, so if you can uh, donate anything, please, please do. And if you can't, you know, times are hard. And if you can't afford to don donate anything, uh, please forward this video on, give it a share, and maybe some other people can. So, yes, thank you very much for your support as ever. Thank you for your help with that. And I look forward to seeing you next week with another story, probably with Amy. Uh, until then, until next time.